Good morning. Welcome. First ARP Church in Lancaster. We're glad you're here. Uh, though it's cool, nice and cool in here, it's going to be really hot when you get out of here. So sit back and just enjoy. I invite you to look in your bulletin about the announcements. There's a page and a half of announcements. I'm going to run through uh, a couple of them. We, we have visitors. We're wel welcome to visitors. There's, I think there's a card in your pew that you can uh, fill out, put in the plate. Uh, the uh, pulpit committee has some news they'll share with you later on. The adult fellowship class is sponsoring a school drive. Tables out front. There's, uh, you're welcome to participate with that. And there's a list of things they need and so forth. Uh, so uh, this is coming up the 28th. Maybe you need to know this. The women are planning a work day. So uh, it says bring a lunch and stay all day, I guess. And uh, in forward in August. Uh, the youth having a yard sale and something that is said that it's on the uh, upcoming events but it's today the ice cream social at 4 o'clock so you might keep that in mind just look at the uh, announcements and uh, you can make sense of what's, what's going on and, and so forth today we have Reverend Delaney with us from Chester he was with us three or four weeks ago, and we're glad to have him back. Uh, he has some news. I guess he'll he, he would share it with you, but I'm going through it too. He has was not ordained the last time he was here, and he read the benediction to you rather than say it. But now he is ordained, and he can do that. So we welcome Reverend Delaney. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. My wife was here with me last time, but today she's with the grandchildren, so um, she wished she could be here, but uh, not that much, so. Uh, but in any event, um, I was ordained on June the 25th, and uh, my calling is to go to smaller churches that uh, can't afford a minister, and which we have a lot of them in ARP these days. And hopefully they can hold on until they can do better. And I'll probably, I, I think I'll be going to uh, Hopewell once a month and uh, maybe even more. And I've, I've been to Union several times. And, of course, Union does have a stated supply. Uh, and I might do that at some point. But in any event, um, that was my calling, is to uh, go to churches that um, couldn't afford to pay a minister, couldn't afford to pay the salary, couldn't afford to pay the retirement, couldn't afford to pay the insurance, couldn't afford to pay for housing or didn't have a manse. Um, and uh, that's what uh, the Lord called me to do. Our call to worship this morning uh, is from Psalm 148, um, 13 through 14. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has risen up a horn for his people. Praise all his saints for the people of, of Israel who are near him. Praise the Lord. And our first song, our song of praise is in your bulletin, but it's also in the red Trinity hymnal, number 376, Now Thy Gates of Beauty. Open now thy gates of beauty.
be seated. If you would, pray with me. Our God and our Father, the creator of all, the, the giver of life and life eternal. Father, you are life, truth, wisdom, and knowledge. You are our hope, our only hope, our heart's joy. Father, we thank you that you made us in your image. Father, make us more and more into the image of your son, Jesus, that we may love, enjoy, and possess you more and more through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it is in, and it's in the name of Jesus that we offer this prayer. But in closing, Father, we pray the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily day bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our assurance of pardon is found in Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 9. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. And next we have the Apostles' Creed. I think I told you last time the Apostles' Creed uh, is one of our creeds. Um, and it's the only creed that didn't come about by uh, commission of the of the saints, uh, it was it came about um, just orally when people would be baptized back in the early church. They usually baptized once a year, and that was at uh, Easter time. And before a person would be baptized, they would ask him, uh, "Christian, what do you believe?" And they would memorize um, the Apostles' Creed. So I tell you, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, now we'll have prayer for our tithes and offerings, a prayer of thanksgiving. If you would pray with me. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your provision. Father, you have provided for us bountifully. Father, we thank you for the privilege of returning and giving to you a token of what is rightly yours. Because, Father, all we have belongs to you. Father, we ask you to remember us as we remember you through our tithes and offerings. These tokens from what you have loaned us. Remember us, Father, in your providence. Look upon us with your mercy, favor, and grace. Use these gifts from what you have provided us for the building of your kingdom, the propagation of the gospel, and the perseverance of the saints. We ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Now for our means of grace, if you uh, turn in the Psalter or look at your bulletin, uh, number 51A, God be merciful to me. May be seated. If you would pray with me uh, for our, our prayer for needs. Our God and our Father, we are needy people. Father, we need your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness to help us live lives that you would have us to live and to persevere in this life. Father, we pray for those in need of healing, both physical and spiritual. Father, we pray for those who have needs. You know what they are. Father, we pray for each family represented here today. We pray that you will grant them their needs, Father. Father, you know their needs, and we pray for their provision and deliverance. Most of all, we pray for those who do not know you, do not know your love, do not know your mercy, the lost, we pray today would be the day that they would receive Christ and rest in him. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray and for his sake. Amen. Today the uh, sermon is on repentance. And no one needs to hear this sermon more than I do. Um, so it's not just for you, it's also for me. But the scripture is... Uh, psalm 51, a psalm of David. Um, the uh, the uh, Psalter we just sang came from that psalm. Uh, and it's one of the best psalms of penitence known, a psalm for repentance. And the context, uh, the biblical context, is 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 15. And before we read the psalm, pray and read the psalm, I want to kind of set the stage and give you the, the context for the psalm. This is a familiar passage to us. It's the tragic story of one of great David's great failures. He had uh, several failures, but this was one of the greatest. Uh, his adultery with Bathsheba, and then his plot to cover up his sin, which ultimately ended in the death of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite, who was an officer in Israel's army. And it wasn't just Israel's army, it was God's army, because they were... God's chosen people. It was David's officer 
Uh, David, who would have been anointed by God and was God's king for his people. In the aftermath of David's great failure, he wrote Psalm 51. And Psalm 51 has been called a cry for repentance. And it demonstrates for us the right response to sin and guilt. You know, it's more than just a story in King David's life. It's a testimony of his repentance. And Psalm 51 reminds us there's only one we can go to with our sin and guilt. And that's the Lord, our great God of compassion, unlimited mercy, infinite grace, unfailing steadfast love. There are three points I'd like to make in this message on repentance. The first point is that sin causes separation from God. The second point is repentance is a process. We must own our sin. We must evidence a contrite heart. We must evidence godly guilt. We must, ev and we must confess to God. And we must ask for forgiveness for our sins. The Westminster Confession says for our particular sins, not just sins in general. But the context is 2 Samuel 12, and Nathan the prophet is sent by God to confront David about his sin. And Nathan did so by telling David a story. And it, he told him the story as if David should act and intervene. And it was a story, it was an account of, of two men, a poor man whose flock consisted of one ewe lamb and a wealthy man who had numerous flocks and herds. And the poor man cherished his one ewe lamb. And the, script, and the story says that the lamb ate from his plate and drank from his cup. And this, in this account, the rich man received a traveler into his home. And rather than using one of his many lambs or something from one of his many herds, he used the poor man's one lamb and he provided supper for the traveler David was so separated and estranged from God by sin and he was so blinded by sin and pride and the arrogance of power that he could not recognize himself in Nathan's story in 2 Samuel 12 in verse 5 begins with David's anger was greatly kindled against the would-be evildoer. And David said to, to, to Nathan, As the Lord lives, this man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he had no pity. Then Nathan dropped the hammer on David, and he said, You are the man. David, the man God had anointed as king of his chosen people the nation of Israel. David, the man the scriptures described as a man after God's own heart. David, the man who had entered into a covenant in 2 Samuel 7 with God, and God was going to establish David's offspring as his kingdom, and the Davidic throne would last forever. With the prophesied Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was called the son of David. In 2 Samuel 11 and 12, we find David at the pinnacle of his life. You know, he was no longer having to do things that he used to do for himself. He had people to do those things. He was delegating things. Matter of fact, he was even delegating his war in this particular occasion. If he had been at war with his troops, he wouldn't have found himself with the temptation. But he wasn't. He was back in his palace. He was the king of Israel, the most powerful king in the known world, but he had a problem. Bathsheba was with child, and Uriah, her husband, would not cooperate with David's first plan of cover-up when he brought Uriah home from the heat of battle. And Uriah the Hittite proved to be a far more honorable man than King David. Uriah would not go home to his house while his men were still in the field engaged in battle and could not go to their own home. So David went to plan B, which was to set Uriah up to be honorably killed, abandon him amongst the enemy, and then bring his body home and make a big deal out of it. David wrote a letter or an order to his general Jacob, or Joab, and he sent the letter to Joab by the hand 
of Uriah. Uriah was a loyal officer. He didn't look at the orders. He did what the king asked him to do. And he delivered the order, which was his own death warrant, into the hand of David's general, Joab, who carried out David's order, and Uriah was killed in battle. When Nathan talked to David, David was so distant and so separated from God that he was able to ignore and repress his sin and move on with life. He had important things to do. He had a country to run. And David moved on by putting away his sin and not thinking about it. He attempted to cover up his sin with hypocrisy. He was no doubt still worshiping in the services and having sacrifices made on his behalf and going on with life. All the while, he was unrepentant hiding his sin, pretending to be someone he was other than who he was, which was a lawbreaker of God's moral law. David believed he could conceal his sin. He could compartmentalize it, wall it up in the past, hide it in his guilt and hypocrisy. And he attempted to bury his moral failure deep in the recesses of his mind. But there were, was a problem. There were witnesses. There was David's general Joab who carried out his order. There were the soldiers who carried out David's order. But more importantly, the scripture says, the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Not only did Joab and the soldiers know of David's sin, but more importantly, another person witnessed David's failure. The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. David was anointed with the Holy Spirit. When a believer sins, we don't sin in private. We don't sin in secret. We sin in the presence of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit lives within us. The Holy Spirit was with David when he committed adultery. The Holy Spirit was with David when he conceived a plot to murder Uriah. The Holy Spirit was with him when he wrote the order for Joab and when he handed the letter in the hand of Uriah to deliver to Joab. God is omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. But when a believer sins, we not only sin against a holy, omniscient, omnipresent God, but we sin in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you would, read with me Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth, in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from me. Blot out my sins and iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. O God, O God of my salvation, my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offerings. Sacrifice, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. 
then bulls will be offered on your altar. If you would pray with me. Our Father and our God, as we study your word, Father, show us Jesus, then show us ourselves. In the words of the ancient Anglican prayer, Father, what we know not teach us, what we have not give us, what we are not make us, we ask all these things in the name and for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Psalm 51 begins with David going to the only one that we can go to for forgiveness. That's God, our creator and redeemer. The only, only God, by his infinite grace and unlimited mercy, can blot out our transgressions against his moral law and cleanse us. In verse 7 of Psalm 51, as well as Isaiah 1, it says, Though our sins are as scarlet, they shall be whiter than snow. And verse 3 in Psalm 51 says, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. David is evidencing a genuine and contrite heart. He's no longer repressing, ignoring, or compartmentalizing, or perhaps trying to justify his sin. David says, I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. David knows what he did was a grievous violation of God's moral law, and he can't get it out of his mind. The Westminster Confession teaches that remorse, being sorry for your sins, uh, is different than repentance. Being, having remorse and being sorry that your sins have been discovered or sorry that you're having to undergo the consequences of your sins is not the same as repentance. And the Apostle Paul distinguishes between godly grief that kind of grief that produces repentance unto salvation and worldly grief or remorse, what the Westminster Confession calls remorse, which is, no, which, is, which is of no spiritual benefit at all and leads to damnation. You know, the, uh, the best example I know, public example I know of remorse or worldly grief, if you remember Several years ago, we had a governor who left on, uh, on a state airplane and went to visit Argentina, where he had found his soulmate who was not his wife. And uh, he came back after Father's Day weekend, and he was ambushed at the airport by a, a, a reporter. And uh, he got in a little trouble with the legislature, and he was trying to gain support from among the legislature. And he would always bring up, well, um, don't you believe in redemption? What about King David? Well, the difference in that situation that King David was, King David was repentant. He wasn't repentant. He didn't go back home to his wife and children, even though they wanted him back home. Uh, there's a difference between repentance and, uh, and remorse. Repentance is godly grief, has godly grief, not worldly grief. And it, today, the prevailing emphasis is that our problems are not of our own making, but they are the fault or something that may have occurred in our past. Maybe it's the way our parents treated us, or maybe it was the way someone else treated us. But that's not consistent with biblical repentance. David owned his sin. David evidenced a contrite heart and godly grief. David grieved over his sin. David confessed his sin. David prays to God and asks for forgiveness. David knows his transgression. He is constantly reminded of his sin. He says, my sin is ever before me. The guilt of sin can creep up upon us. And David was constantly reminded. He was reminded of his sin perhaps when he saw his own reflection in a mirror or in a pool of water. He was reminded of his sin when he saw the faces of others. He was reminded of his sin when he saw familiar places, but he didn't make excuses. He didn't blame his personal failure on anyone else or his circumstances. He cries out to the Lord, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love and abundant mercy. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. In verse 4, David confesses to God. Against you only have I sinned and done evil in your sight. We say, wait a minute. It, 
Was it just God that David has sinned against? What about Uriah? What about Bathsheba? But sin, in the biblical sense, is against God. There are consequences. Others may get hurt in the process. But when we violate God's moral law, which is summarized in the Ten Commandments, we sin against God. David faced his own sinful nature in verse 5 when he says, I was brought forth in iniquity. He knew that he was born in sin. He knew that outside of God, there was nothing good in him. The world says that man is basically good, that perhaps children need to be taught to be bad, but that's not biblical. We are born in sin. We are estranged from God. Paul says in Romans 7, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is my flesh. For I have desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry out. For I do not do the good I want, but I do the evil I do not want. That is what I keep doing. And the New Living Translation says, and I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. Then in verse 7, David prays for restoration. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be whiter than snow. It is important for us to remember, in order to receive forgiveness, we have to ask God to forgive us. David's sin had grave consequences, not only for himself, but for others. Even after repentance, even after receiving God's forgiveness, we are not relieved from the consequences of sin. And one of the many consequences David suffered throughout his life because of his sin, the first one was the loss of the son born to Bathsheba. The child was somewhere around a year old when the Lord took him from David. And David loved the little boy and begged God not to take him, but to no avail. We can be forgiven for our sins, but sin has consequences. But there's only one we can go to for forgiveness. David prays to God in verse 10, Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Man's only hope for forgiveness and salvation is a change from the inside. The Old Testament calls this change from the inside a circumcision of the heart. Jesus, when talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, called it being born again, told Nicodemus that he must be born again. Paul, in Titus 5, called this process regeneration. God gives a believer a new nature, a new heart, and it comes with new affections, new relationships, new desires, a new life. We experience a quickening of the Holy Spirit, being made alive, born anew, born again. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, we are quickened, made alive, making us a new person in Christ. Ephesians 2 tells us that we were once dead in our trespasses and sin because we only had one nature. That was a sinful nature. And dead men and women can't choose. Dead women, men and women can't resurrect themselves from the dead. The quickening of the, Holy, quickening of the Holy Spirit is the only thing that can break the stranglehold of sin on our lives. And in verses 11 and 12, David prays, Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. You know, the Holy, the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament. But unlike in the New Testament, after Jesus had done his work, the Holy Spirit would come to believers for a specific purpose, for, 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 them to, for God to help them for, in a specific purpose, like Gideon, for instance, and others, but, uh, or for a specific position, like David as being king. But under the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit resided in the believer for a temporary time for the performance of that purpose of position. But as a result of Jesus' work, under the new covenant, Jesus tells us in Matthew 28, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Verse 14, David says, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God of my salvation. David repents of his sin, which ultimately led to the death of an innocent man. The Westminster Confessions re reminds us that it's our duty as believers to repent by naming our sins with particularity, 
True repentance requires us to turn from those sins. And in verses 16 and 17, David says, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. And 2 Samuel says, To obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is far greater than empty and hypocritical worship practices like David was committing. The scripture teaches that repentance is not just a mechanism for opening the door to salvation by belief and trust in Jesus Christ, and then we move on with our lives. Even believers who are new creations have a new nature, have a new heart in Christ with the spirit of Christ living in us. We still need to repent daily because we still possess our inherited sinful nature and we continue to stumble and sin. But the difference is we have a new conscience, which leads to repentance. The questions for us today is, when did we last repent? Are we living lives that others can see something different in us? Can others see Jesus in us? Or have we allowed the love for Christ to ebb out of us at a point that we are distant and estranged from God in danger of failure? Without obedience, without reading the word, prayer, worship, and repentance, the result is an ebbing of the love of Christ in our lives. When we are not concerned for the lost, our lost family, a lost friends, a lost world, we stare into spiritual bankruptcy. Remember, remember how Jesus loved you. Remember when you became his. Repent and be restored. Has your love for Christ diminished over time? Or have you ever had a love for Christ? Have you ever experienced being born again, a regeneration? If not, the scripture says, today, is the day of salvation. And Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If you sense a stirring in your heart or a drawing or a knock at your heart's door, receive him today and rest in Christ today. If you would, pray with me. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for the truth it conveys. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will work in us and provide conviction where conviction is needed. And Father, I pray especially for those who are lost. I pray that your Holy Spirit would unlock their heart, quicken them, giving them saving faith, calling them from a state of sin and death to a state of grace and salvation in Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And for his sake and for his glory. Amen. Okay, now we'll have our response to the gospel, which is, uh, O thou that hearest when sinners cry, in your bulletin or in the red Trinity hymnal at four, the number 485.
Now for the free offer of the gospel. I wonder if you know why that's in there. It's because uh, that's what associate and associate reform Presbyterian means, a free offer of the gospel. Uh, there were certain members of the Church of Scotland, the Reformed Church, who uh, had a problem with predestination uh, interpreted the way the church was interpreted in Scotland. We thought there's a free offer of the gospel for everyone. We didn't know who that person was that God was going to select, but the gospel should have been offered to everyone. And so that's how we came to be. So we seceded from the church in Scotland, and then we came to this country, and we uh, started our own denomination. But um, anyway, free offer of the gospel. If you have never made a decision for Christ, if, if you have never come to know him, uh, today is the day. As the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. If you'd like to talk to somebody, I'd be glad to talk to you, or if you would like to talk to one of your elders, talk to them. But uh, today is the day for salvation. Now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.